Alrighty, this is lecture two, which is the Earth Moon system. In this lecture, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about the Earth, and we're going to talk about tides some, and we're going to talk about the Moon itself. Let's start with the composition of the Earth. Uh, so the Earth is a terrestrial planet, meaning that it is one of the four inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. They are all the terrestrial planets, meaning it is Earth-like. However, um, the Earth is not just a rocky planet like Mercury, Venus, and Mars. It is also covered in water. Um, but its rocky surface are composed of minerals, which are composed of chemical elements, such as silica and oxygen, which creates our silicate minerals, such as, I don't know, quartz, which is entirely silica and oxygen. Uh, on the surface of the Earth, we have a lot of silicate material. It's most common on the Earth's surface. Uh, elements aren't just all over the place, though. Um, things have been layered, I guess you could say, is the best way to say it. So as the Earth spun while it was forming, our lighter elements rose to the top and our heavier elements fell to the bottom. Uh, kind of like the centrifuge process in biology, where you have your lighter stuff moving to the top as it spins, heavier things will sink. So our surface is mostly these lighter materials such as silica um, and oxygen or silicates. We have some sulfates, sulfites, we have some others that are iron based, but mostly we're going to see silicates, which makes it easy to see what makes up the surface of our planet. But how exactly do we know that we have heavier material underneath us? Mm hmm. Well, we use seismic waves. Uh, seismic waves end up becoming like the ultrasound for the Earth. Uh, waves will react differently as they interact with materials of different densities or liquids in the ground, which basically forms an image like what we see here. The density of the Earth itself is about 5.5 kilograms per liter, which is averaged for the whole planet. And based on the crust, we know the crust is about three kilograms per liter, okay? So, crust is three kilograms per liter, whole Earth is about 5.5, very interesting. The three kilograms per liter is due to the composition of the crust being primarily silicate minerals, which is much lighter. Therefore, the interior, such as the mantle and core, must be greater than 5.5 kilograms per liter so that the average will equal such. The only element with a high enough density for that is actually iron, which has a 7.9 kilogram per liter density. Okay, we also know that nickel and magnesium are prominent minerals in the mantle thanks to uh, uh, volcanic activity bringing up the olivine mantle, which is primarily nickel, magnesium, and iron. Okay, so we know that we have this, this chemical segregation that has occurred because of this. Uh, and then because of this ultrasound, we're able to see within the Earth things like magma chambers, where we can see the difference in densities, where we can see where it's harder and where it is still liquid or if it's a crystal mush. Um, we can see where we have denser layers in the crust that are hard because of this. Right. There are two seismic waves. You have the P wave and the S wave. These are the two major waves that we're going to learn about in astronomy. There are a lot more. I know we learned about some of them in Earth science. If you took Earth science, uh, you learned about surface waves, etc. But we're sticking with P and S waves. P waves are reminiscent of sound waves in how they move because they vibrate the material in front of it. P wave stands for primary or push wave. It will arrive first. It will push or pull. Basically, it is a compression wave. It compresses as it moves along. Um, it can travel through both solids and liquids. Okay, it's very important, solids and liquids. The second one is the S wave, which stands for secondary or shear wave. This arrives second. It is the side to side motion and can only travel through a solid. If you wanted to think of what a P wave looks like, get a slinky, and as you push the slinky back and forth, it will compress, and you will actually be able to watch the compression wave move back and forth in the slinky itself. Super cool. 
S waves are side to side. So if you were to take a rope and wiggle it side to side, you would be able to see that. Uh, for example, we have a cord here that I can use to show S waves. So S waves do this. And you can do this at home. You can do this with a friend. Some of you have probably done this in gym class or when you go to the gym and you have a trainer and you need to do uh, the ropes part of the exercise. That's where you're going to be getting that shear movement or that side to side motion that S waves produce. So because of this, an earthquake um, should occur at the North Pole. Let's say an earthquake occurs up here at the North Pole. Okay. On the opposite side, about here, there would be no S wave, but you would get a P wave. Reason being, and this is how we know it, the interior of the Earth is liquid, and S waves cannot pass through liquid. So let's go over the interior of the Earth then. Uh, analysis of seismic wave data, basically how fast or slow a wave went, has indicated there are four zones to the Earth. The crust is our low density material. It's about 20 to 70 to kilometers thick. Okay, and then we get our mantle. Uh, the mantle we tend to split up into inner and outer or upper and lower mantle, but we're not gonna talk about it that way. We're gonna talk about it as one conglomerate thing. Uh, the mantle is hot, but not quite liquid. It is mostly magnesium and iron and silica or olivine. Uh, and we get pieces of this material when there are volcanic eruptions. It is more dense than the crust. So waves will actually move slower here. Usually, again, we think of it as upper and lower. Uh, the upper mantle is mostly solid material. Uh, it tends to be paired with the crust and called the continental lithosphere. Uh, the lower mantle is close to the melting point. This material will act as a solid, but so it, it's technically solid, but it will act as a liquid when put under stress, so it flows. This region is geologically known as the asthenosphere. The outer core is liquid and dense. It is made of nickel and iron and sulfur. Uh, what is ascertained from this is that the Earth is density differentiated. Okay especially since the inner core is just iron and nickel, and it is solid. Okay, so this tells us we have a density differentiation, meaning densest materials have sunk to the center and our lightest materials have risen to the top. So why is the inner core solid, but the outer core limit? Let's find out. The center of the Earth is at high temperatures. Uh, it's actually a highest, so high that most rock would pretty much be melted at. Uh, but it's under such extreme pressure due to all the weight on top of it. And the compression causes the atoms to be pushed together, making it actually a solid rather than a liquid. So as you go deeper into the Earth, the temperature actually will rise about 2 Kelvin, 2 Kelvin, every 100 meters. Okay, um, so if you think about it this way, when we go down into the earth, we tend to get cold first and then it starts to warm up. But that's because we tend to go into caves. Caves are naturally cooler, they're well insulated, and there's running water. Okay, but if you were to just dig straight down in a hole, as if you were digging to China, like many of us probably tried when we were kids, or at least had the idea, digging to China, every 100 meters you go down, you would increase to Kelvin. Okay, this idea of a temperature increase with depth suggest, uh, checks out with volcanoes because in volcanoes we have liquid rock spewing out from an eruption um, where it's going up to thousands of degrees Celsius. 1700 Celsius is the average melting point for basaltic magmas. So it means the deeper you go, it must get hotter or we wouldn't have melting rock. Uh, the temperature increase isn't infinite. Uh, by measuring escaping heat, as well as modeling processes in the Earth's interior, such as knowing a specific depth you need to have a certain temperature to melt a certain rock, um, you're able to determine the temperature of the core to be about 6,500 Kelvin, which is easy. You will definitely melt iron-rich rocks at this temperature.
at, you will melt at this temperature. The movie The Core is very wrong about being able to just travel to the core. It's quite impossible. <laughs> Too hot. So if we put this into perspective, um, zero Kelvin is minus 273.15 Celsius. So if it is 27 degrees Celsius at the surface, or 80.6 degrees Fahrenheit at the surface, it would be about 300.15 Kelvin. Okay. So if we add two to that every 100 meters, it's going to get hot pretty fast, correct? Well, the idea of an increasing temperature in which temperature with depth checks out, again, volcanoes, um, you have liquid rock spewing out, but again, not infinite. Okay, so why is it so hot at the core, though? You know, it's 6,500 Kelvin. Why is it so hot? Uh, the hypothesis of early Earth formation is that it is a result of multiple pieces and ma of ma and slash masses of matter colliding due to gravity, which generated heat, and this led to our molten core. And as it spun, differentiation would have occurred. After the surface began to cool, forming the rocky exterior of the geosphere that we live on. Um, so if the outside cooled, why hasn't the inside? That's the question. Uh, so think of a hot potato. Uh, the surface may cool off enough for you to hold it, but if you cut it open and try to eat it immediately as soon as the surface cools enough to hold, you will burn your mouth. Um, and this is because though the surface cools, that surface protects the interior. Even if it's only a small amount of protection, it still protects the interior. So it takes a long time for that whole potato to cool off enough for you to eat it. So with this crust, at the surface of the earth, um, only a small amount of heat actually escapes at a time. The idea is a larger object will cool slower than a smaller object because there's less surface area exposed to the cold of space. A smaller object will also have a thinner outer layer to blanket it. So therefore the moon is cooler than the earth due to its smaller size and thinner crust. So reasons for how the core is heated. Molten Earth due to collisions in early Earth. Heat from the core is slowly escaping through the crust where it disappears due to exposure to the cold of space. But what's the second way that the Earth generates heat? Because by now, technically, you know, 3.6 billion years later, or sorry, 4.6 billion years later, wouldn't the Earth be cool by now? Well, there's a second way the Earth generates heat, which is radioactive decay. Uh, the Earth is like a nuclear power plant in this aspect. You know, when unstable isotopes decay to another isotope, it releases energy in the form of heat. So a parent turning into a daughter, thanks to half-life, results in heat. Okay, let's take uranium-238. Uranium decays into thorium-234, um, and this decay series keeps going until it reaches the stable isotope lead-206. Some of these isotopes decay in a series, and that series only lasts a few moments before it moves on to the next one. Um, other ones will last years, and sometimes even decades, or hundreds of years, or millions of years, or billions of years, which is why we can use them to date things. Um, so the two types of decay in this series are the alpha and beta. Uh, and the split causes a release of heat due to the energy released. Okay, so alpha decay, we're going to lose a neutron and a proton, or one helium ion, plus heat. Beta decay, you'll lose an electron, plus heat. So either way, you're getting heat. The heat released would keep the Earth warm, just as it's the reason nuclear reactors and power plants can be so dangerous because they can just overheat and melt down. This heat, when they decay, occurs in the interior of the Earth and then is trapped by the outer rocky layers. So for example, um, on the crust, we do have some material, radioactive material that is decaying that we use to help uh, date things like volcanic eruptions. But that means that radioactive material that we're dating, um, and it's not enough for you to get sick every time you go visit a volcano. It's just enough to know, hey, this much potassium has decayed into argon, um, maybe there was only this much radioactive potassium in the entire volcanic eruption, but we know 
this much argon is left and only we have only this much potassium. And so now we know how long ago this eruption happened. It's not just at the surface. It didn't form up here. It's down beneath in the mantle, for example. And so since it's below the crust, this outer crust is able to save it, prevent it from escaping as fast as if there was no outer rocky mountain. So remember that heat is trapped within the earth by the outer layers of the crust when it occurs internally. So we have two models of the earth uh, that we're going to really talk about in some detail, but not much. Um, and this is the layer cake model and the whole mantle model. Um, this is highly debated between scientists as to which process is actually used. But I personally am a fan of the layer cake model where you have an upper mantle and a lower mantle and you have flow happening in the lower mantle like this or in the asthenosphere, which creates our convection. Um, and subduction does not go past the boundary between the upper mantle and the lower mantle. This makes the most sense to me. Um, the whole mantle model indicates that slabs from subduction can make it all the way to the core boundary, which I think makes less sense. But these are the two theories that we've created. So overall, the process of heat transfer in the Earth occurs um, by convection. This is this is actually pretty accepted. Convection is the reason that we have major amounts of heat transfer, both in our atmosphere and beneath the Earth itself. And this is why tectonics exist. So historically, we have matching mountain ranges, which would have formed when two continents collided, uh, causing pieces of crust to go up. We also have the same fossils showing up on different continents, which means that either the continents were stuck together or these these creatures had ways of traveling that we are not privy to, such as portals, because they had portal guns and somehow escaped from the game Portal. Uh, they somehow created rafts and canoes. And if you can imagine a T-Rex rowing a canoe, um, I think that would be pretty comical. Or they made ships, or maybe they were actually way more advanced than we thought, and we are the least advanced ones. Who knows? But <laughs> the way that seems most um, to make most sense, and the fact that we have all this 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 other information, such as the mountain ranges, where we have pieces from one continent stuck on another continent in these mountain ranges, um, in addition to fossils of things that didn't swim or fly showing up on multiple continents, plus things like Antarctica having fossil remnants of jungle-like plants, which means that at one point it must have been warmer, which means it must not have been at the pole, it must have been closer to the equator. We can say that tectonics exists, okay? We've also been able to use GPS to know that continents are actually moving centimeters per year. With GPS, uh, scientists are able to monitor this to the millimeter. So they were able to determine that the European plate and the North American plate, for example, are moving apart at about 2.5 centimeters per year. That's pretty insane. Other reasons we know that there is plate movement is because of subduction, where you have two plates coming together, and one plate is has an uh, is greater density than the other, which means it would travel beneath the plate, forming as it went down. You would have an increase in heat, which would lead to magma formation, which would come up, forming volcanoes. Okay, and we have these. We have the Cascades. We have um, Indonesia, Japan, the Aleutians, which is actually the little islands coming off of Alaska. Um, we have New Zealand. Those are all parts of subduction. Another thing we have is our hotspot volcanism. Hotspot volcanism is, uh, for example, Hawaii. Um, and how this works is underneath the crust, you had magma forming at depth. Okay, so it's, it's a basaltic magma, so it's very, very hot. And it just comes right up and forms a volcano. And this, in, when it occurs in the ocean, forms volcanic islands. Um, and so what happens is you have the island moving, where now you have multiple islands forming, like Hawaii. And it's not that this is moving. It's this that's moving. It is the crust itself that's moving. 
which is pushing uh, the islands down, and then magma comes up and creates a new volcanic island, and the crust keeps moving, and a new volcanic island. Uh, and the last one is magnetic field or paleomagnetism, which is where we get the magnetic dynamo process. And basically what this looks at is how north and south, magnetic north and south switches, where it goes from being regular north and south on the Earth to becoming south and north magnetically. And this happens every so many hundreds of thousands to millions of years. Um, and it's pretty neat because it's it's this magnetic shift in our field. Super cool. Um, and we're able to look at that in old layers of magmatic uh, rock, which has come to the surface, cooled when it became lava. And as it cooled, all of the magnetic material aligned itself with north-south. And so we're able to see when it's in normal and reverse polarity. Okay, so remember heat moves through convection. Um, and convection helps with plate movement with subduction. Okay, uh, so heat brings up molten material, which leads to the mid-ocean ridge type thing where we have ocean spreading, such as the Atlantic Ocean is spreading. But then at some point, you know, it, it's going to run into something else. And it's not just going to continue going as it runs into something else. One piece is always going to be more dense. Ocean floor can is always denser than continental crust. Um, and this has a combination to do with continental crust is mostly silica, which makes it, it has a lower density versus this, which is mostly basalt, which means it has a higher density. Okay. And the higher density material is going to go underneath the lower density material in a process called subduction. Um, and so with convection pulling up material, other material is then going to come down. And this is known as slab pull. Okay, this is the cooling material, which is the sinking of a cold, dense slab. Okay, the sinking of a cold, dense slab of oceanic lithosphere. Um, this is the main driving force of plate motion. Subduction primarily occurs around the rim of the Pacific Plate, forming the Ring of Fire. Shark bait, ooh ha ha. Um, this forms the Andes, the Cascades, New Zealand, Indonesia, Japan, and the Aleutian Islands. This is also why there is no oceanic crust older than about 80 million years, because plate movement causes subduction, which means all older material ends up subducted down into the Earth. This plate movement is also what caused the formation of many mountain ranges. As if, so if the density of the two crusts are the same, they won't subduct. In fact, they'll just create. Um, and this is where we get the Himalayans and the Appalachian Mountains. So let's outline this a little bit for you. Here's our Aleutians. Okay, subduction. We have a trench here. Uh, cascades. We have subduction going on down here on the west coast of Mexico, the Andes Mountains in South America. Here is New Zealand, Indonesia, Japan, it's just Philippines, all of it. It's all due to subduction. Okay, so when we have stuff like two, two plates coming together that are the same density, instead of, of one going underneath, you will instead have them bridging up like this, and they will form mountain ranges. And this is what's happening with the Indian plate and the Eurasian plate, and that's how we're getting the Himalayans. And the Himalayans are still moving. Uh, that's why they have such they have so many earthquakes in India, is because the plate is still moving up into the Eurasian plate. Uh, hotspot volcanism, though, such as Hawaii, um, and though it's not showing up here, uh, Yellowstone is hotspot volcanism. This occurs in the middle of a plate rather than along the edge. So if the plates didn't move, a hotspot volcano would only have an eruption in one spot. So there would only be one Hawaiian island. But because there are many Hawaiian islands, and they actually kind of do this, we know how the plate is moving. So since the plates do move, the mantle plume will create a path of volcanoes or volcanic islands 
that we can actually follow. So for example, the Yellowstone hotspot, which is currently, I think, around here, actually does that. So it started over here, and this is where it is today. It has moved because we have moved. Okay, so the fifth way, uh, which is the magnetic field of the Earth. Uh, so remember, almost every astronomical body will have a force surrounding them called a magnetic field, and Earth is no exception. Um, it's because of this field that our compasses will point north, and why we have a ma we have magnetic material, such as you know magnets. Um, and this all has to do with that. So every so often, every so often, our magnetic north switches, which makes our geographic north pole magnetic south and our geographic south pole magnetic north. Okay, they are offset a little bit, so they're about 90 degrees. Our magnetic field is formed due to the electric currents flowing in our molten iron core. Basically, it's alive in a process called the magnetic dynamo effect. It is theorized that this process is the result of the churning and swirling of the core caused by the Earth's rotation itself. Um, and this magnetic field is also what forms our magnetic poles. Magnetic north is nine degrees from true north, um, the rotation axis in northern Canada. And magnetic south is 25 degrees from true south, which lies between Australia and Antarctica. So every so often our magnetic north and south flip. This happens about one time in a million years which is known as a crin. And then there are alignment shifts over time as well, which are known as crons. Okay, so how do we know all this? Well, when magma forms, lava doesn't have magnetism yet because it's too hot. So as the lava cools, the crystals will align themselves with the magnetic north, allowing it to record Earth's magnetic field at that point of cooling. Um, and this creates a magnetic, a magnetic record where we can actually see where we have regular or normal and reverse um, magnetism in our Earth, which is neat. Um, so the most well-preserved of these is actually the mid-ocean ridge basalts, which have symmetrical banding. Uh, we can also see it in other uh, um, ridge points, such as the ones on the Juan de Fuca plate. But the best ones are from the mid-ocean ridge, which is forming the Atlantic Ocean. Now we're going to talk about tides a little bit, because now we're going to start to get into the moon. The moon's gravity attracts the ocean towards it. So we have the Earth. We have the Earth. And one of the things that revolves around us, well, the only thing that revolves around us, is our moon, our only satellite. Okay, uh, And the moon continuously revolves around us. And as it revolves, Let's go this way. As it revolves, it pulls on the Earth as much as the Earth pulls on the moon because of the law of action reaction. Where there is pull, there will be an equivalent pull by the other object. So the moon pulls on the Earth as much as the Earth pulls on the moon. Okay? And this leads to some really interesting things, such as tides. Because as the moon's gravity pulls back on the Earth, it attracts the water on the Earth. Um, and this is how we get our, our tides forming because of this combined gravitational pull and the way that the earth rotates, um, it causes a bulge along the equatorial region. So not all of the water just goes straight this way at the moon. It's pulling towards this particular spot on the moon. So what ends up happening instead because we have the equator, because again, the Earth's tilted, I think about 23 degrees, right? Um, so thanks to this, we end up, instead of having um, everything pull directly at the moon equally, it forms a bulge, meaning the, the water kind of moves towards the center because it all wants to get to this point here in order to get to the moon. And so it causes a, a bulge system on either side of the Earth to form, where technically, if you want to think about it, the oceans are deeper at the equator, 
if that helps make any sense. Not actually, but if, if that makes sense in your head so you remember that there's a tidal bulge, it's, there's a bulge. Um, and this is caused by the gravitational forces exerted on the Earth by the moon and to a lesser extent the sun. Okay, and this is known as the tidal force. Okay, and this is where our tidal force comes into play. Uh, so this means that the tides actually vary. The farther away from the equator you get, the smaller the tides are. Tides are generally 24 hours and 50 minutes long, okay? That means they're almost a day and an hour longer. And this is not our solar day. This is actually our lunar day. And a lunar day is actually 24 hours and 50 minutes, if that helps. Okay, um, so that means tides occur later each day with eight hours between each tide, okay? Um, depending on where you are on Earth depends on what tide you have. So generally you can have one high tide and one low tide a day, or you can have two high tides and two low tides a day. So it varies a little bit, but generally every 24 hours and 50 minutes, if you have one high tide per day, it means every 24 hours and 50 minutes, you will have a new high tide. And you will have 16 hours between. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, something like 16, 17, 17 hours-ish in between. Um, but if you have two high tides and two low tides, then it becomes about eight hours each day. Super cool stuff. So this all has to do with the moon pulling on us. Okay, so now let's get a little bit information on the moon. Because our moon is special to us. Um, not only does it cause our tides, um, we see a lot of cool things in the sky, such as um, solar eclipses, lunar eclipses, which we had one last spring. If any of you saw it, it was pretty neat. It's definitely fun to go outside and watch um, because uh, lunar eclipses have this cool thing that happens where the moon turns momentarily red, blood red, which is also nicknamed the blood moon. So moons are neat. Let's talk about what the moon is. The moon is basaltic. Um, it is theorized to have formed when the Earth was actually hit by a large body resulting in a spray of debris uh, forming the Earth. But basically what happened was baby Earth. We had baby Earth. Baby Earth was impacted by um, a, a protoplanet, basically another protoplanet or a meteor of some sort. And it caused a huge spray. Poor Earth had a huge chunk taken out of it, which became our moon. Well, how do we know this? We can theorize this all we want, but how did we, how did we actually figure this out? Uh, so the Apollo mission brought back uh, lunar samples, which scientists conducted geochemical analysis on um, and their geochemical analysis told them that the moon was both the same and different from earth oh that's weird meaning that they were poor in iron uh, they had a low melting point material like iron but they were high in melting point materials like uranium however why is this similar and different? How, what does this actually mean? Okay, it indicates that the moon's formation would have occurred after differentiation had already occurred in Proto-Earth, meaning the core had already formed. Iron would have already sunk to the core of the Earth, leaving silicate materials on the surface. At this point, a Mars-sized body is what is expected to have, um, when they modeled it, that's what they needed, a Mars-sized body, so another protoplanet would have collided with Earth, spraying crustal and mantle debris, which would have collected and been gravitationally attracted to the Earth, forming our moon. Now let's go over the different features of the moon, because there are many features, and they are kind of cool. So the moon does have highlands and lowlands. Um, the highlands are the bright spots you see on the moon. Um, they're about... 4.0 to 4.9 million years old. Um, they surround the Maria, which are the large dark patches that we see on the moon, which are 3.1 to 3.9 million years old. Maria is Latin for sea. 
Um, and these are what we think are large craters on the moon, those giant dark spots. Uh, but they're actually very large, smooth basaltic flows. So all those gigantic dark spots, they aren't craters. They may have one point been craters or something impacted. Um, but because of that impact, um, you had these basaltic flows that formed from the inner part of the moon when it was still molten internally, which led to these smooth basaltic flows forming these dark spots, um, which were rich in iron, magnesium, and titanium silicates. Um, and then this then never had major impacts again. So these, these Maria are still very smooth because they don't have many impacts compared to the highlands. So the highlands are older. These are the bright spots uh, that we have on the moon. Um, and these highlands have a lot of impact craters. They're older, they are less dense, and they are pitted with so many craters, including micro craters. Um, they are rich in calcium and aluminum silicates, much less dense, and is very similar to our own Earth's crust, whereas the Maria is very similar to our mantle. Okay. Um, we also see things called rays. Rays can be seen from Earth in most times. Uh, they are actually spattered material found around an impact crater. They look a little bit like sun rays. Uh, for example, Tycho. Tycho has, um, is a crater in the highlands and it has all these rays around it, which is sprayed material from when it got hit. Rills are these lunar canyons. So yes, there are lunar canyons. Um, some are straight and due to crustal cracking as the moon cooled and shrank. Um, others, weave from craters indicating that they're actually lava flows which is super cool about 4.5 billion years ago uh the moon was formed and when it did form it was molten at the time of the moon's birth uh it was differentiating okay so it came out as this molten orb from being uh, because uh, baby Earth was still molten and that impact occurred and the material that came off was molten. Okay, so it's spinning. Um, and as it's spinning, just like with the Earth, it's differentiating, uh, causing a aluminum and calcium rich crust, which is what the Maria, uh, not the Maria, which is what the lunar highlands are made of. Um, and what iron it had fell towards the center. Okay, at this time, we have the crust forming, it's starting to cool. Okay, the solar system is still forming. Um, and because the solar system is still forming, there's still small bodies flying around, um, meaning that you have these other protoplanets moving around, um, causing impacts. So the Earth and Moon were still being bombarded by foreign bodies, like asteroids, uh, which is how we get so many of the craters that we see at the lunar highlands. Uh, but as the crust thickened due to continue cooling, remember, smaller body cools faster, um, a small number of large about 100 meter diameter bodies struck the surface. Um, these caused these giant deep craters to form with ripples around it, which we can um, see here. These are ripples forming around these, these huge craters that formed. Okay, um, and this would have cracked the crust deep enough, or it would have been such a, a it would have been such an impact and shock uh, that it would have pushed up mountain chains around the edges, which is what we see here. Uh, and it would have gone so deep that it would have cracked enough that molten material would be able to escape from the interior, flooding the crater. And then after this happened, which is what would have formed Maria's, and after this happened, the impacts lessened to the point where they have actually, these Maria's have actually been able to stay relatively smooth. However, there are no folded mountain ranges and volcanic peaks on the moon. If there are, they're very, very rare, which indicates a lack of tectonic activity. Uh, scientists have studied the moon's interior with seismic activity, just like the Earth. Um, but moonquakes are very rare because the moon is much less active as measured by seismometers. Most of the earthquakes on the moon are actually due to landslides or from stress put on the moon by the Earth. But we know that there is a core mantle and crust 
Uh, the core is probably slightly molten still. Um, and the surface is covered in what we call regolith, which is shattered rock and dust. It is tens of meters deep due to impacts. Um, and this is how we, how footprints are left on the moon. The crust itself is 100 kilometers thick. And the mantle is solid. And it is about 100 to 700 kilometers thick. It has a low density, meaning there's little iron. Um, it has a slow to no rotation, and there is no magnetic field at all because there's almost no rotation. There is also no atmosphere on the moon. It has too weak of a gravitational field to have formed an atmosphere. Uh, the escape velocity is very low, which would allow gas to escape easily, and so the and there is no gas production which would have replenished an atmosphere. The result is that nothing is stopping the impacts of any and all sorts, even microscopic. Temperature changes dramatically from 380 to 120 Kelvin and 40 Kelvin on the poles, which never get any sun. However, there is evidence of water preserved under the surface of the poles, which is pretty cool, which um, may have come from the material that became the moon from Earth. Um, because there's never really any sun at those areas, it's been able to stay as ice rather than heating, um, becoming water vapor and escaping. Fun things. So uh, theoretically, the moon would have once had a rotation itself, um, but due to the Earth's pull on it, the rotation has actually kind of stopped, which is something called being tidally locked. And we'll go over that in a bit. Okay, so as we should know, the gravitational pull of the moon on the Earth is what causes the tides. And the Earth exerts gravitational pull on the moon. The moon as we see it appears to only face us on one side, meaning the moon doesn't rotate on an axis. However, it does appear to rock back and forth, which is evident by movement of certain formations. So while it doesn't rotate relative to the Earth itself, it does rotate relative to the sun and stars with its period. Um, so to its orbital period, known as synchronous rotation, it is very slow. Okay, so synchronous rotation. Moon appears to only face the Earth from one side. It appears to rock back and forth rather than actually rotating on an axis. But in relation to the stars and sun, it does rotate. Um, but its period is equal to its orbit around the Earth, which is very slow. Um, it may have been faster when it first started as when it first started rotating around the moon, but the gravitational forces exerted by the Earth on the moon and vice versa has slowed its rotation and offset the core of the moon, meaning it's no longer actually in the center, which is where we expect it to be. It's actually offset slightly. Um, causing the moon to actually be more elliptical than round in shape. Um, and the Earth's spin is also currently slowing due to this same force known as tidal force. And if the moon had oceans, it would produce tides similar to the Earth. However, instead, the moon's shape was distorted. How would the Earth's pull slow rotation? That's a good question. The moon has a bulge on one side, which is hypothesized to be due to the resettling of material due to impacts. Um, this led to an off-center core, um, and this bulge was pulled on by the Earth until its rotation slowed to a synchronous rotation, which is called tidal breaking. Okay, Tidal breaking from the sun may also explain why Mercury and Venus also have such slow rotations. Now we're going to go over lunar cycles, because that's cool. Okay, so as the moon orbits the Earth, it will rise and set 50 minutes later each day. Okay, um, this is known as the lunar day. So it is 24.5 hours. So if we go by the lunar calendar, this means that the days kind of shift, which is why in the Chinese calendar, uh, Chinese New Year is never on the same day. <laughs> Good to know, right? Um. So, as the moon orbits the Earth, it will rise and set 50 minutes later each day. Um, and as the moon rises and sets, it changes its appearance, which we call phases. There are two terms to label these phases. When the moon is becoming fuller, it is known as waxing. And when it is becoming more like a crescent, again, it is becoming waning. 
At the end of its cycle, crescent to crescent, it will disappear, forming a new moon for a night. Okay, the whole cycle is called a lunar month, and it lasts 29.5 days. Lunar day, 24.5 hours. Lunar month, 29.5 days. Names are given to each of these phases, which is also seen in the table. So the crescent moon, you have the waxing and waning crescent. This is the beginning and the end of the cycle. When the moon is half lit, it is considered the first quarter and third quarter. So if it's waxing, first quarter. If it's waning, third quarter. When we have uh, three quarters full, it's the waxing gibbous. When it's three quarters full, but waning, it's known as the waning gibbous. And then when it's completely illuminated, it's known as the full moon. And when it is not illuminated at all, it is known as the new moon. Okay, this is both the beginning and the end of the cycle. It is the tie in the middle because this is a circular pattern if you think about it. So the quarter, new, and full moon uh, titles indicate where in the lunar orbit the moon actually is. The new moon indicates it is close to between the Earth and Sun as possible, meaning it's almost completely between them. Okay. When we have a full moon, it is the opposite, meaning it'll get a complete light from the Sun, um, but the but we will be able to still see it. With the new moon, the new moon's different. The new moon still gets completely lit by the sun, but we don't see the lit part, we see the shadowed part. Whereas when we have the full moon, the shadowed part fades away from us and the lit part faces us. Okay. The first quarter means we are exactly 90 degrees, or the moon is exactly 90 degrees from the sun. And the third quarter is the same thing, 90 degrees. The phases of the moon correct, correlate directly with the sun, not the shadow of the earth. The shadow of the earth on the moon only works with a lunar eclipse. The area of illumination changes with the moon relative to the sun. As we can see in this image, it depends on where the moon and which area is lit. So when the moon is opposite the sun, we see the illuminated side, but when the moon is between the sun and the earth, the illuminated side is facing the sun, not us, so we may mostly only see a sliver. So how do we get these um, eclipses then? Well, those have to do with where exactly the moon is, and that's why it's kind of rare. Um, especially for you to have it in the same spot every day, because it actually depends on the angle of the moon compared with the moon, or uh, compared with the Earth. So as the moon orbits around the Earth, it's actually 27.3 days, as this is how long it takes for the moon to return to the same position it was before relative to the stars, and this is known as a side real month, okay? So this has nothing to do with the Earth. This has everything to do with facing what's what the Earth sees, so the, the stars. So when here we have the new moon aligned with the sun and a star, okay? After 27.3 days, the moon aligns with the star, okay? It realigns with the star out here, but compared to Earth, it's still a waning crescent. And then after 29.5 days, the moon again aligns with the sun, making it a new moon. So this is the difference between a lunar month and a sidereal month. Okay. Due to Earth's rotation around the sun, our perspective changes. So we don't always match up with that star and the sun again, but we need the moon to match up with the sun and us to have a lunar month. But for there to be a sidereal month, the moon has to line up with the star again. So it actually takes an extra couple days to reach the lunar month. From our point of view, 
the sun has shifted to a new constellation in the zodiac at this point. So the moon needs to orbit about two more days, which is known as the sidereal day, to return to the same position relative to it. Um, and that's how we get our zodiac changes. And that's why we have um, the different months. Every so many months, you have a new, oh, you're a, you're a Taurus. Now you're this. Now you're that. Fun stuff. Okay. So you remember, sidereal month is when the moon has to realign with the star, not the earth and the sun, the star. Okay, and after 29.5 days, we realign again with the earth and the sun, creating the end of a lunar month. From here, we will have a new moon versus a waning crescent. Okay, so in total, it's a total of about two more days. An eclipse occurs when the moon lies exactly between the Earth and the sun. Exactly between the Earth and the sun. Or when the Earth lies exactly between the sun and the moon. So that sounds like it should happen all the time, right? All the time. Except it doesn't. Um, and the reason for that is because of angles. <laughs> so when the Earth gets exactly in line with the sun and the moon, it will cause an eclipse. Uh, if it's the moon between the Earth and the sun, it's known as a solar eclipse. If it's the Earth between the sun and the moon, it is known as a lunar eclipse, okay? Uh, but what ends up happening is um, if the moon isn't close enough to Earth or if it is too far away from Earth, it won't completely block the sun. So, there's a specific spot in its orbit that creates a solar eclipse. And what that causes is the light from the sun itself actually casts a shadow on the Earth. And the same thing happens when it's in the correct thing. We cast a shadow on the moon, which causes a red moon and this with its corona. Okay. Um, the reason for the solar lunar eclipse becoming red is because of light getting bent around the Earth, which is neat. And it has to do with uh, blue light being scattered within our atmosphere, but red light going through. Super cool stuff. Sorry, my lighting is being strange. Uh, so this leads to uh, both the lunar eclipse and the solar eclipse. And a lot of people like to go see the solar eclipses when they happen. And it's a big spectacle. Total solar eclipse is when the moon completely covers the sun, from our perspective, okay? Around the moon, we'll see the outermost layers of the sun, which is known as the corona, which is this bit. Um, and this is very much not safe to look at. Please do not look directly at this. Um, but how it works is, um, to, to make this easier, let's, let's make this a little easier. If you hold up your hand with your thumb up, and focus on something rather far away from you, like someone's head. Hold it until you can see that object around your thumb. Okay, um, so think of being a painter and you're trying to measure how big someone's head is and you're using your thumb. You're going to close one eye and you're going to do this until that object is covered by your thumb. And then bring it slowly closer to, slowly farther from you until that object can be seen around your thumb. Uh, that's the difference between, between a total solar eclipse and a partial solar eclipse. So with a total solar eclipse, the moon is between the Earth in a way where it will cause a shadow to fall on the Earth. In a partial solar eclipse, the moon is too far to completely cover it up. So only part of the sun is covered. A total lunar eclipse, though, is when your Earth's shadow completely covers the moon making it turn a dark orange to red for one hour due to the sun's light bending around the Earth. This is actually safe to look at. Um, but during a solar eclipse, cool stuff happens. Ooh. Lunar eclipses are neat, but solar eclipses are very fascinating. Um, solar eclipses last only a few minutes when fully eclipsed. And during this time, the sky will become black light night, and birds as well as various animals will act like it's nightfall. And around the moon, we will see the outer atmospheric layer of the sun, which aren't normally visible, known as the corona. And if you watch it in a tree area with leaves, 
It will act, they will act as pinhole cameras, allowing you to watch the eclipse occur. And this is super cool. Um, with a total lunar eclipse, the Earth's shadow will completely cover the moon, which is why you can see the curve of the Earth against it, which is part of how we know that the Earth is, in fact, a sphere. Um, sunlight bends around the Earth, though, because of our atmosphere, it will filter out all the blue light. And this is why the uh, eclipse moon obtains a reddish color, which we know as the blood moon. Solar eclipses are only viewable within narrow areas of the Earth because the moon is so small. These bands of full eclipses where the sunlight is completely blocked is called the umbra. Umbra. Okay. Umbra means full eclipse is visible. So if you are in the umbra, you will see a full eclipse. And these tend to go only along a um, narrow band when we have a solar eclipse. And um, so, let me think about how to explain this a little better. Um, yes, uh, so this is why when the last solar eclipse happened, there was a band across the United States where you could visit to see the full eclipse. Um, the one close part closest to us where it covered was South Carolina. Um, the areas where the sun's light is only partially blocked, though, is called the penumbra. Okay, uh, this is the area around the umbra right here. So this is the penumbra. With the lunar eclipse, the umbra tends to be a bit bigger because it's the size of the Earth that's covering the moon, not the size of the moon covering the sun. So it's much easier to see the umbra of a lunar eclipse in many more places than a solar eclipse. And the penumbra is also much wider. This also plays into how well people can see things. So that's why, uh, what we understand of as solar eclipses to us only happens so many years, but actually solar eclipses happen every year. It's just not always where we can see them. Sometimes a solar eclipse will happen over, over out in the middle of the Indian Ocean and you're not going to be there or out in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. You're not going to be there. People are not going to be there. So it's not something we're going to see versus having it go an entire span of the United States, people are going to flock to those areas to see it. And that's something that only happens once every so many types, many, many years. Um, but these eclipses um, happen, there's usually one solar eclipse per year. It just depends on where it's going. But partial eclipses or penumbras occur two times as often as total eclipses and are visible from larger portions of Earth. Ancient astronomers would use solar eclipses to study the outer layers of the sun because you can actually see the corona. The ancient Greek and Chinese astronomers were accurately able to even predict eclipses. And as the moon's orbit is not circular, the umbra doesn't always reach the Earth because sometimes the moon is too far away, meaning the Earth is smaller than the sun, and so there is no place where there is a total eclipse. So even when they are perfectly aligned, you will still see a ring of the sun's surface around the moon, and this is known as an annular eclipse. An annular eclipse is when the moon blocks the sun, but not completely, okay? Meaning the sun's surface is still visible around the moon's surface. Like this, okay? This is an annular eclipse. Uh, lunar eclipses, though, have a much larger umbra, like I mentioned earlier, as the Earth's shadow is much larger than the moon's, and so it can be seen from whichever side the moon rises above the horizon. On. Um, similar to an annular eclipse, the moon is two times as likely to pass through the penumbra of the Earth's shadow than it is to enter the umbra for a lunar eclipse. Partial lunar eclipses um, is when part of the moon enters the umbra. And a penumbral eclipse is when is the weakest lunar eclipse because no part of the moon enters the umbra. And this is a very minor occurrence. Okay, so why isn't there a lunar eclipse every month if they happen so often? So the moon's orbit is actually tilted about five degrees, meaning it doesn't happen on the same plane as the Earth's orbit. It happens slightly off. 
of Earth's orbit. So that means the moon has to be at a certain point of its orbit in order to be in direct line with the Earth and the sun in order to cause an eclipse. And this can't happen at every part of Earth's orbit. So for example, let's look at this part of Earth's orbit. Here, too high, too low. The umbra doesn't reach Earth. And during the lunar phase, the umbra doesn't reach the moon. Same thing here. Here, we do have a chance. And so this is why, so this is why um, you have a chance at this happening two times per year. Once when the Earth is at this part of its orbit and once when the Earth is at this part of its orbit, okay? Um, so if you have a solar eclipse in May, either two weeks before or two weeks after, you will have a chance of a lunar eclipse. And then about a half year later in November, it can happen again. The times of year do shift due to the moon's precession, also known as its wobble, um, meaning the orbital plane will shift. Um, and this shift will make dates change about 20 days. Um, and this wobble or this precession takes 18.6 years in order for the, uh, the moon's orbit to return to normal. Um, but there will always be at least one solar and one lunar, lunar eclipse per year. Sometimes there are two of either, and there can be up to five or six. Most, however, are only partial eclipses or may only be viewable from specific places on Earth, like the ocean. And this is the end of this lecture. I hope you have enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please let me know. I will be more than happy to answer them. And if your classmates would like to answer them as well, please do so. And I will see you next time.